Good evening. I'm Steve Weberg of the Kansas City Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you and, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you especially because you're here to share and, and we hope participate in what in many respects is a, is a difficult discussion. And because it's difficult, a, a discussion that, that tends not to happen often enough. Uh, Ivan Maisel, as, as he writes in his new book, I Keep Trying to Catch His Eye, spent 55 years assuming that tragedies happen to others. And then in February, 2015, it happened to him and his family. He lost his son, Max, to suicide. Max had just turned 21. He was in college in New York and he'd given his family no indication that he was as ill and as deep in despair as, as he was. The tragedy underscored a, a growing concern over the past decade. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death across the entire population of the United States, but it's the second leading cause among college students. From 2007 to 2018, the suicide rate among 15 to 24 year olds increased by a third. Ivan's with us tonight to talk about Max and his loss and how he has navigated his grief over that loss, which he details in his book. And yes, in many respects, it, it will be a difficult conversation. But Ivan, who's one of the most respected and admired sports journalists in the country, lends this very personal story, the same eloquence and grace that he's brought to his profession and what used to be my profession for the past 40 years. This book, which was released just yesterday, is about loss and sorrow. There's, there's no escaping that, but it's also a portrait and a very moving portrait of, of a loving father and family. And it's, it's a study in not getting over the loss and sorrow, but getting through it and still having a fulfilled life. If you're a fan of college football or follow it at all, you're, you're probably familiar with, with Ivan Maisel's work. He's covered the sport nationally since 1987, and I could recite a laundry list of best writing and other awards that he's won in that time. There are a lot of them. But the best measure of his stature in the game might be that probably the greatest coach in its history, Alabama's Nick Saban, a pretty famously tunnel visioned guy who keeps an arm's length from the media and its distractions values Ivan as a guest on his weekly radio show. Ivan spent more than 18 years as a senior writer for ESPN and also has written for Sports Illustrated, for Newsday, the Dallas Morning News. Since this past June, he has been a vice president and senior writer for the new college football focused website on three.com. It's our privilege to have him here tonight. And I will tell you that it's truly my honor to have him as a friend. Uh, if you have a question for Ivan over the course of our discussion, you can submit it via the YouTube live chat box. We encourage you to do that. And we'll get as many answered as we can at the end of the presentation. Ivan, thanks so much for being here. This is this is a bit of a different setting for a visit, I think, than we're accustomed to. Yes, there's a remarkable lack of beer bottles and bitching about deadlines, but we'll try to make through it and get through it anyway. Um, so to, to start, Ivan, tell us about Max. Max uh, was our middle child. Uh, we uh, also have two daughters. He was a quirky kid. Uh, early two or three years old was diagnosed as being somewhere on the spectrum. That was as specific as uh, diagnosis as we ever got. You'll see in these early photos uh, a smiling, seemingly happy kid. Uh, he, uh, I always thought it was proof of God, that God had a sense of humor, that Max had absolutely no interest in sports. Uh, you know, my son, uh, who I naively had assumed would uh, follow in my footsteps and learn to read by reading the sporting news and learn to do division by doing earned run averages, couldn't have cared less about any of it. Uh, but he and I bonded over 
the Marx Brothers over Bob and Ray. You know, he had a wickedly dry sense of humor. Inherited, um, I will say. I'm, I'm sorry? Inherited. Inherited, yeah. I, 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 uh, I, I, tried, I, did, I did train him well in that. <laughs> uh, he did like to ski. And I, I show you this photo not only to prove he did, he did have a couple of athletic bones in his body, but if you see there, he's not smiling. And that's a, you know, he's a teenager. And somewhere around adolescence or puberty, you know, whatever, whenever teenagers start having problems, Max decided he didn't want his picture taken anymore. Uh, and he only did it, you know, when his mother put her foot down. Uh, the irony in that is he loved to take photos, was an accomplished photographer, was majoring in photography at RIT in Rochester, New York. Uh, but I keep trying to catch his eye. The title of the book is a reference in part to uh, a photo I have of him uh, that is still the wallpaper on my phone in which the two girls are looking right at the camera and Max is looking up and away. And uh, I can't get him to look at me. I mean, you, you wrote that in your book um, um, in, in talking about the, the, the fact that you didn't have sports to bond over. Um, you know, you had made sports your life uh, or your life in sports. Um, has, has it been difficult in the past year to, to maintain your own sense of humor? If God had a sense of humor, was it... <laughs> over the past six years, were you able to maintain your own sense of humor about that? I think, Steve, early after Max disappeared, and he he died in a, on a cold, very cold night by, we assume, and we'll never really know, walking out onto the surface of Lake Ontario until the ice cracked beneath him. Uh, you know, we do know he his, I mean, his, we recovered his body from Lake Ontario eight weeks after he was, after he disappeared, but, you know, we don't know what happened there. Uh, but there were indications that he, uh, he had in, you know, there was suicidal ideation, ideation. Uh, we decided pretty soon after he disappeared and, and I, I say we, my family, but it was mostly, I'll speak for myself from here on out. I decided early on, I could either live in a fetal position or I could continue to experience what my life would be. That if I try, you know, I, just, I just decided if I try to stay, I can never really stay where Max was. And that applied to humor uh, that applied to joyful experiences. You know, two weeks after Max's body surfaced, our nephew got married. So we had a decision to make. Were we going to go to the wedding? And, you know, did, were we, did we want to go to the wedding? Not particularly. But I thought, well, if we don't do that, if we're not going to laugh, if we're not going to experience joy, then we lose again. And we had lost enough, I felt like. So... You know, early on, it was kind of fake it until you make it, but I, I can still laugh and, and I, can, I can experience joy and you know, time has a lot to do with that now, but it, it's possible. I have to tell you that I was, I was moved by something you said on a, on a couple of different occasions. Um, first, to your, to your wife, Megs, and your extended families when, when they gathered with you after Max's disappearance. And, and then a little more than a month later in, in your eulogy at, at Max's memorial service. And you said, we, we've never been ashamed of Max and we're not going to start now. I mean, it's a beautiful sentiment, but it also would seem to have been and, and continue to be important to your emotional state. I mean, I, I wonder how many parents in that awful situation have difficulty with that. Well, there is, there is stigma attached to mental illness and there is stigma attached to suicide. And what I learned in, in a very hard and awful way is mental illness is an illness and it can be as insidious and as deadly as cancer. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, nobody is ashamed of anybody who has cancer. And, 
And, you know, I just decided I wasn't, if somebody wanted to deal in stigma where Max was concerned, that was their issue. That was not going to be my issue. And the other part of that, Steve, to be honest with you, especially in those early days, it was all I could do to get one foot in front of the other and to try to hold some sense of secrecy to try to remember who I was going to confide in what really happened and who I didn't want to know because I didn't want, I didn't want to make it public. You know, I, I didn't have time to, you know, run top secret clearance on everybody. It was, it was easier. Just put it out there and, uh, you know, let me do the best I can to, you know, pick up the pieces of my life that were on the ground, you know, that it shattered like a vase and try to put them together. You know, I, I, the last thing I wanted to do was deal with that. Well, and besides that, I suspect you, you want to honor Max. You don't want to dishonor me. Well, sure you do. And, uh, I wanted, I didn't want Max part of the reason that we were public was to change the subject, mm -hmm. you know, to not let Max be defined by how he died. You know, let's talk about who he was and how he lived. And, uh, you know, people are going to talk and people are, are going to look at you. Uh, you know, look, we were in the, we were in the newspaper. You know, we, you talk about sense of humor, even in those dark days, the four of us, you know, Meg and our daughters, Sarah and Elizabeth, would snicker at the idea of Max, you know, being in the newspaper and being on, on PeopleMagazine.com, you know, because he, you know, the, the son of an ESPN person had disappeared, and you know, the, those four letters gathered attention. So uh, we wondered about that because Max says, you know, didn't want his picture taken, didn't want attention. And uh, he, he certainly got a lot of it there after he disappeared. Did, did you have to, to, to fight off the feelings of, of what if, the, what did we miss? What could we have done? Uh, and, and you weren't alone in that respect. You, you found out after Max died that he had reached out to his college counseling center and the mental health professionals there said they saw no flashing red signs. Um, how hard was, was, was that in the immediate aftermath? Um, within the first week, I received a phone call from a woman I grew up with. Uh, her mother and my mother were best friends. And I had not, her name is Robin Gerwich. She is one of the country's leading experts on children and terroristic trauma. She was a, she was at Oklahoma State University when the Murrah building blew up. So she dealt with all those families, you know, God bless her and, and became an expert in just the worst, one of the worst subjects possible. Robin called me the week that Max disappeared. We had not spoken in decades, but we picked up right where we left off. And she said, you will never understand why he did this and there was nothing 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 i remember she said it three times you could have done to prevent it uh, because when you look back you are thinking with a rational mind and in the end max was not thinking with a rational mind he was irrational so that i i took great comfort in that i mean of course i have what ifs and uh, you know, we, as a parent, you have what ifs with all your children. You know, the difference with Max is you can't try to make up for it now. Uh, we have a finite uh, amount of memories with Max. And, and because of that, and we can talk about this when we talk about grief, I, I want people to bring him up to me. I want to talk about Max. I want them to tell me stories about Max that I don't know because I, you know, I, my inventory is small and will never get any larger unless somebody else adds to it. So uh, it's, yeah, of course I look back and, and there's a lot of things I kick myself over with Max, but I also know he was sick. As, as I was preparing for, for tonight, I, I, I visited with the 
president of the uh, KC Suicide Awareness and Prevention Program. Her name is Emily Snow. She was very helpful. She said that the, the families of those who've died of suicide, and you just talked about that, and especially those who've lost teens do want to talk about it. Uh, they want to talk about the loved ones they've lost. And what you've said, obviously, just collaborates. It. Yeah, I, you know, and, and people are scared to bring up. One of the reasons I wrote the book, Steve, was because I was so bad at grief and grieving and comforting those who are grieving. And the, the, the word that kept coming through my head was docent. You know, I, I, this book is, is me being a docent through grief and my grieving with the idea that if I can show people maybe not to be as scared of it as, as most Americans are for whatever reason, this reasons this society is scared of death and of grieving. If, if you understand that it is a part of life, you can handle it better when it happens to you and you can comfort those around you better when it happens to them if you learn to be comfortable around it. And, and one of the ways is, is to talk about the one who died for, for the reasons I said. And, and it's, it is a, it's a tough concept. You know, people would say to me, well, I didn't want to bring him up. And I would smile uh, to mask my you know, native smart assness. And I would smile and I would say, well, you know, if you hadn't have brought him up, I wouldn't have been thinking about him, you know, because uh, you are obviously you're thinking about it all nonstop. So, of course, you want to talk about him. You, you, you started writing about Max and, and losing him almost immediately after he died, I, I think within a week or two, I mean, long before the idea of this book existed. I mean, if I can ask. Why? And that might seem like an obvious question uh, or a question with an obvious answer, but I'm not sure that would be the default for every writer. I'm not sure it would have been my default. I needed to, I mean, that was how I grieved, Steve, to be, to be honest with you. Uh, I am, uh, I do not do conflict easily. I do, not, you know, I'm much better at tiptoeing around it. Than, than confronting it. Uh, the way for me to excavate all the feeling I had uh, was to dump it into this laptop and, you know, not burden, you know, obviously our daughters and, and my wife were devastated as much as I was and my wife's probably more. Uh, so this was a way for me to grieve in the least uh, intrusive to them way possible. Uh, and it's also what I do. You know, writers write, and I'm much better at conveying my thoughts by sending them through the, my fingers than through my mouth. Uh, so at the outset, I couldn't even type a complete sentence. My mind was racing so fast. The, the first few days that I uh, typed into the laptop, it was just sort of sentence fragments and feelings. And slowly, uh, I would wake up most mornings before dawn when the house was quiet and just type 750, might be 1500 words, might be 300 words, type them into the laptop and I would feel a lot better. And over the course of probably 18 months, I went to two or three days a week, to once a week, to once in a while. And then I think I had gotten, a, gotten enough of it out that I could get on with a semblance of my life. Three years ago, at the start of the 2018 college football season, you, you put together a very moving story, both, both video and in print on, on Mark and Kim Holinsky. Uh, their son, Tyler, had been a quarterback at Washington State University. He was set to become the starter. Um, and three weeks after the end of his sophomore season, he died by suicide. Uh, first, uh, here, here's a cut from uh, your ESPN on-air piece 
uh, about the Helenskys. Hello. There he is. Hi, man. Hey, how are you, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Nice to see you. Hey. Thanks for coming. I was taught to keep myself out of the story, and this story just demanded that I get in it. When I read last January that Washington State quarterback Tyler Helinski ended his life, my stomach flipped, and not just for the obvious reason. Tyler was a college junior, 21 years old, the second of three children, hundreds of miles away from home. Almost three years earlier, my son Max ended his life. He was a college junior, 21 years old, the second of three children, hundreds of miles away from home. We're all in a in the club that nobody Sorry, wants to join. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. With, uh, and they should still be with us. Yeah. Right. I remembered people calling me after Max died and how much their experience helped me. And I finally thought, you know, maybe this will help them or maybe it'll help somebody who sees this. And that's when I reached out to Mark. I had never talked to anybody um, in my spot. <laughs> um, and I, um, I read Max's story. My feeling when, when I heard about Tyler was, I think the disbelief that anyone would have that a young guy like this that seemed to have so much going for him would have been that low that this was his only way out. You'll never understand why they did it. And all you can do is, is try to pick up the pieces of what's left of your life. I mean, you initially turned down a suggestion by your ESPN editor to get into that story. Um, as you said in the piece, you, you were taught as a reporter to keep yourself out of the story. But you also you know, saw this as ultimately demanding that you do get into it. Um, was it a swallow hard and get into it? Uh, what, what were your emotions? Um, Steve, what I didn't want to do was the, 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 the whodunit. You know, I, I didn't want to write about what happened. Uh, that I, even I felt was a little intrusive. Uh, Greg Bishop of SI did that story and did a masterful job of it in June of 2018. So after that story ran, as the football season approached, uh, the, uh, the game day producers came to me and said, we'd like you to do something. And you know, we'd like to do something and we think you should do it. And, you know, I had been at ESPN at that point, uh, almost 16 years and they hadn't asked me to do much. So I just said to him, look, uh, his name is Drew Gallagher, the, the producer. I said, Drew, I, you know, obviously we, I, you know, we both know why you're asking me if I'm going to do a story, you know, my expertise is, is, is as a parent, let me do a story on Mark and Kim. And he said, well, that that's a great idea. Uh, so then I had to gain Mark and Kim's trust. And I emailed Mark, uh, you know, and, and I should say as an aside, 
that in the days and weeks after Max disappeared, I heard from fathers who had lost sons. Some of some of them I knew, some I didn't, uh, who just reached out to me and you know talked about where they were on the timeline and and this is what happened to me in the days and weeks afterwards and really sort of held my hand. So I felt uh, a little bit of a duty to pay it forward as it had been paid forward to me. And uh, I emailed Mark, he emailed me back our first conversation on the phone went an hour and 10 minutes. And uh, they, he and Kim trusted me and the, the story was, as you saw a part of it was just a, uh, the beginning of what has become a, a, a friendship. And they, they helped me and Meg uh, as much as Meg and I helped them emotionally and, and just with support. Well, and you, you, you mentioned in that piece as you um, did a little earlier that you know, the potential in, in sharing your story to, to lift up somebody else who's gone through the loss of a child or, or anyone to, to suicide. And, um, you know, you, you, you write, quote, if the story of my relationship with Max resonates with those who read it, then it would be nice to think that a sliver of this awfulness helped someone. Um, how much do you hear from people, whether it's directly or indirectly, that, that you have indeed helped? I, I hear from, you know, it, it ebbs and flows uh, as, you know, there might be, you know, now that the book is coming out, I'm hearing from a lot more people uh, that have lost someone or know somebody who has lost someone and can I connect them to you? And, and of course I say yes. And, and I look, uh, I make it very clear to everyone uh, who contacts me, I am not a, a expert in mental health. Uh, I am an expert in one case of mental health that didn't go very well. Uh, so I can't help people psychologically. You know, I, I can only help them. This is what I experienced. And this is what, this is how I learned to handle it. And, uh, you know, and in that sense, I'm, I'm happy to help whoever asked me, but you know, I, I'm not a, I'm certainly not a counselor. This is probably a good time. We, as we've been talking, we've, we've had some audience, a couple of comments, not questions, but comments that I might read to you and, and everyone else here. I don't have a question to ask, but I was in the group of Max's friends online. It's hard to realize how much he's been gone almost as long as we knew him. Um, thank you for helping put this pain into words. And a second comment, much the same. I, I was also in that group. I also don't have any questions, but thank you so much for saying all of this and for creating a space to talk about this kind of grief. Um, you're making a difference tonight. Well, those, those uh, young uh, men and women that Max was friends with, with on, online, mostly were online. Some were at RIT. Uh, they were all, they all played video games together and, and enjoyed anime together. And Meg and I really didn't know a lot about them. You know, Max kept that part of his life secret from us. Uh, in part, I think when he was younger, he did it because he had been told not to talk to anybody he didn't know on the internet, <laughs> which uh, Max was a rule follower to, <laughs> to the nth degree. Uh, so he didn't want us to know. And you know, meanwhile, when, when he did finally tell us, we were just delighted that he had made friends. Uh, and these guys and men and women were great friends to Max. And it, uh, their devotion to him still, as, as their comments tonight indicate, means the world to the four of us, it really does. Well, and it's obvious that what you're doing um, and, and you talking about Max and you sharing the story means a lot to them. So, uh, an epiphany for you was, was coming to the understanding that the way to handle grief is by equating it to love, quote, it soothes me to realize why I hurt so badly. I love Max 
I always will. My grief is the most tangible evidence I have of that love. Is that what you see as the central, uh, let's call it a tenet or, or takeaway from the book? I do, Steve. Uh, grief is love. And it took me a while to formulate that thought uh, in my head. And, and I think uh, part of it, now that, that's Max's uh, stone and that, that's my attempt at artful photography. You can see me in the, in the reflection of it. Uh, I, I this, Early on, I read a poem by a, a wonderful poet named Edward Hirsch who wrote about his son who had died and he described grief as uh, the carrying a bag of cement up a hill that never ends. And that crystallized to me that I was never, I was always going to have to carry this burden and that I just had to get used to grief. And so then I began thinking, well, why, why was this hurt so much? And it dawned on me that the amount of grief I had was commensurate with the amount of love I had for Max. And that uh, rather than fight that pain, uh, give into it because understanding that it was rooted in love and let it uh, wash over me, you know, especially as time went on, you learn that you are going to feel bad, but then it's going that the worst days or the worst hours or the worst minutes are going to end. Uh, the, a friend of ours who lost her husband to a heart attack suddenly said to me, and this may have been come from a greeting card, but I think it's brilliant. She said, you know, what helped me was, was reading that grief is like standing at the seashore. And sometimes the wave washes over your feet and sometimes it washes over your head, but both times it goes back out. And so that all of that contributed to me understanding that the pain hurt so much because I had so much love for him. And after that, it was just, you know, like, like the, like you and I always do it was boiling the language down to the barest minimum. And it just made sense to me that grief is love. Um, by the way, as you're talking, another um, comment, I think from Max's uh, group of online friends, uh, Kansas city native, also one of the people in that group, I deep, Deeply appreciate having received my copy of the book today. Thank you for letting me be part of his story. So we- That's nice. Uh, everyone handles, you know, everybody grieves and everybody handles grief differently. Um, were, were Meg or, or either of your daughters, Sarah and Elizabeth, hesitant about you laying out your family's pain and anguish so publicly? and permanently, um, you know, in the piece on the Holinskys and, and now, especially in this book. Uh, they know I write and that they know that's how I best communicate. Uh, I, when I finished, uh, well, the, the short answer would be to say that, that I owe them a great debt of gratitude for their indulgences of me. Uh, when I finished the manuscript, I gave it to all three of them and said, you know, Whatever you think, you know, let me know. If there's something you don't like, I'll try to fix it. If I can't fix it, I'll take it out. Uh, and I said to Meg, you know, cause there were a couple of things she really didn't like. And it was a result of me just misinterpreting something that she had done or something that had happened. And so I, you know, I said, if I can't fix it the way you like it, I'll send them their money back. You know, it's not that important. Uh, you know, we, it was never, I was never going to write this book at the expense of the three of them. Um, so they were great and uh, they, they've been good. You know, having this come up, uh, especially now being very public, uh, it, you know, it, it's stirring up something for all of us. You know, I, Elizabeth and I were talking Monday night you know, she's dreamt about Max in the last day or the last few days, and so have I. And uh, that's not something I, that either one of us happens 
to either one of us very often. Um, you narrated the audio. You narrated the audio book yourself. Um, how much more difficult, if it was, to do that than writing the book? Um, you know, to hear yourself recount the experiences and, and express the the heartache out loud was. I mean, was this something that was important to you to do? It was important to me to do uh, mainly to make sure from a creative sense that the, the stories I was telling, you know, and I'm, I'm sure you felt the same way. We hear a rhythm in our words and you want the story to be told the way you want it to be told. And uh, I wanted the emphasis to come out on the right things. Uh, you know, when, when I imitated my, uh, Yiddish, the Yiddish inflected English of my grandmother, I couldn't imagine an actor being able to do that better than I could. Uh, so in terms of the emotional uh, heft of doing it, I think, and this is also the case with writing the book, Steve, that I had to get to a place where I had my legs under me before I could write the book. And, and uh, that took time, you know, the time provided me the perspective to see the story clearly enough to write it. Uh, and, and I, you know, to me, the, the audio book was as much, was, was performative as much as anything. You know, I, I wanted to best, I thought I could tell it better than an actor could. Uh, so, the, and I did, there were a couple of times I got choked up, but uh, I have a lot less fear in all of my aspects of life about how I look or, or what people think of me than I did before Max died, because I now know that that's not, if I screw up or if they think I did poorly, that's not the worst thing that's going to happen to me. So, you know, it, uh, I will tell you though, just as a, as a professional tip, uh, if you're in a hurry, you may want to play the audio book at 1.5 speed because <laughs> I, I do speak a little slowly. I grew up in Alabama. So. More slowly than you walk. <laughs> yes. Keeping up with you was a chore. <laughs> <laughs> and actually what you just said, I mean, your life changed six and a half years ago. In what ways, if any, has Max's death changed you? Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to the things that you mentioned in the book. You spoke at a fundraiser a couple of years after he died and you said, quote, I'm a better person now. Uh, later, yeah. you, you, you write, quote, he, he reordered my priorities. I mean, can you go into that a little bit, explain? Yes, and, and saying that out loud really shook me because it sounds, you know, you don't want to think that you, you benefited from somebody's death, much less the death of your child. But the fact is, it was a life experience that uh, opened my eyes a lot about empathy and kindness. And I'm better at that. I'm better with those qualities now than I used to be. It, and it, because of that, uh, I think I'm a better writer. And, uh, and I'm also a better writer because I have perspective now that I didn't have before Max died. You know, this is, uh, as I write in the book, I used to get to big games and I would just choke because it was such a big game. You know, I, I would just get too worked up. And now I understand it, it's a game. And, uh, and having that perspective just made me uh, a better journalist, uh, you know, a journalist at the end, you're not, you, there's no reason you should get worked up. You know, you're not participating. You're telling, you're observing. And 
Max's death crystallized that for me in the sense that I now, you know, I understand better. I, you know, I'm not part of this. I'm watching it and I'm, I know how to tell a story. I'm going to tell that story. Well, that's, and that's process. I mean, did it change what you wrote? Has it, has it affected what you wrote? Uh, maybe the subjects I'm willing to take on or the yeah. subjects that I'm interested in. Yeah. I think so. I'm, I'm a little more interested in feelings now uh, and, and how something affects someone rather than, you know, who's number one uh, or, you know, what, you know, what does this mean for the playoff? You know, uh, no offense. I know you used to be involved in the playoff. Uh, but uh, you know, yeah, I, I'm much, I'm much more interested in, I guess, in the human side of stories than I used to be. Um, I'm going to go back to something we, we touched on a little bit earlier. You, you, you make a point in the book and I, I mentioned speaking with Emily Snow of the suicide awareness and prevention program. And she thought it was an important point. And, and you wrote that, that mental illness needs sunlight. Um, and much as you said just now, you, you, you wrote, we as a family need to talk about it for reasons of catharsis. We as a society need to talk about it very simply to save lives, not just the lives of those considering it, but the quality of lives of those whom suicide leaves behind. And um, I, I, do you do you see society? How do you see society doing in that regard? I mean, do you think people are becoming more comfortable in talking about it? Are people more comfortable in approaching you, for example? Uh, you know, in kind of allowing that sunlight. I think people are more comfortable addressing suicide. Uh, you know, we we as a society recognize, you know, I don't know if saying there's an epidemic is hyperbolic, but we recognize that there are uh, more people considering and actually, uh, you know, ending their lives than there have been. You know, the, the analogy that occurred to me today uh, is it, it's kind of like climate change. You know, we as a society and we as a world are much more uh, aware of the need to change, but we're not changing fast enough to deal with what's out there. And I think that you can apply that to what we're doing with suicide too. We're much, we have a much healthier attitude toward mental illness than we used to, but the problems of mental illness created by mental illness are multiplying much faster than we are changing the way we're dealing with them. And we just need to do better. Um, actually, a, a pertinent audience question here. Um, uh, have you always been open with your grief or were there times where you felt like you needed to hide it? Oh, I was the, well, and, and I get into this in the book, I was the worst. You know, my father died in 2007 and I handled it terribly, uh, to, you know, and, and much to my, you know, everlasting chagrin. Uh, I kept thinking, you know, he'll pull out of, he had cancer. And I kept thinking, well, he'll pull out of it. He's still getting treated. Uh, I didn't really address it with my kids because I, I just couldn't handle talking about it to them. And, and they loved their grandfather. And I did them a disservice by not preparing them well. Uh, in his last weeks, I didn't sit by his bed and, and, and hold his hand and talk to him and try to comfort him. And I, I had a litany of reasons why I didn't, I shouldn't do that. And, you know, just, uh, it's, it's just awful, you know, and, uh, I would love to have a do over you know, and he knew I loved him and, and I know he loved me and. And he was, uh, you know, a, a great dad, but I just blew it. And uh, maybe, you know, I, I'm, this book is part of the zeal of a convert, right? You know, now that I've kind of, you know, uh, gone through it in a much 
uh, rawer, more intimate way, uh, I'm trying to, to spread the word. Um, going back to the, the Helenskis, um, you wrote that when you were preparing to, to interview them, you came to the understanding that you, you could offer them some perspective. You were, you were three years down a road that they were just still in the early stages of traveling. And you wrote, and I'll, I'll quote again, it won't be your former life, the good one, the one with healthy children where mental illness was something that happened in other families. That life is gone. This life, this new life will never be that full but it can be fulfilling. How much effort does that take? And, and where, where would you say you are on, on, on that journey today? That's a good question. I, well, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm better off even than when I, I wrote that three years ago. Um, I think, uh, I do feel more joy now when things are joyful. Uh, we still think of Max and talk about Max in our house regularly. And, you know, you try to carry as much of Max as you can as you go down the road, but uh, life continues. And, um, you know, I'm devastated that, that he, he's not continuing with us, but, uh, I, you know, you just, uh, there's nothing I can do about that. And, and to try to, uh, you know, time has done a, a very good job of, of, of developing scar tissue over my grievous wounds and you just go on. And uh, there's no science to it. There's no timetable to live by. Everybody is going to handle it differently. But you'll just find that pretty soon you're having a good five minutes. And then maybe you're having a good hour. And then maybe you're having a good day. And, um, and then after a few years, you know, you're, you are able to handle when good things happen. You can appreciate them. I want to um, bring in a couple of, of uh, audience questions. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Max's interest in theater. Even though sports was never high on his list of interests, theater and journalism share some qualities from a storytelling perspective. Do you feel like your work in that respect played into his interests? That's a good question. I, I'd like to think so, but I will tell you that we we took pains as parents to uh, inculcate a, an appreciation of theater into our children. We live an hour from Manhattan, where the you know the greatest uh, actors and actresses in the world ply their trade nightly, and so at some point we just decided you know, the, we were going to haul them in and, and to a, at least one and at least one musical a year and, and maybe also a, a, an actual play. And uh, they loved it. Uh, the first one we went to was Oklahoma and we played the soundtrack in the in the minivan for months before we went to the play. And uh, they uh, they love that music. Uh, they, and I think at the time they were like five, eight and 10 years old. And uh, Max in particular liked comedy. He loved slapstick and farce. It may have been me, you know, preparing him with the Marx Brothers, but. And your tastes merged there, right? Right. Yeah, we went. Uh, I remember we went to see Noises Off, which is just the silliest, greatest slapstick uh, play ever. And, uh, and I just remember him being bent over double, which was quite a feat because Max was 6'5 and didn't weigh 140 pounds. So he was a pipe cleaner and he was bent over in laughter. You know, we saw James Corden, who, you know, before his CBS career, 
in a play on Broadway called One Man, Two Governors about a, a, a helpless servant trying to work two jobs as a butler. And, you know, and, and it, it was, there was a lot of physical comedy in that. And Max just thought it was the greatest. Uh, he loved, uh, but he also loved music you know, and musical theater as well. So uh, that was a, uh, whether that is a result of, of my creative tendencies or, or just us, you know, parking them in front of it, I don't know, but that's a nice thought to, that's a nice question to consider. Um, one final question here from, from the audience. Um, this book is a tribute to Max. What do you think he would think about the book? And what you've read? <laughs> we talk about that all the time. Uh, you know, kind of a offshoot of, of you know his disappearance, him appearing in People Magazine. I, I went on Good Morning America Monday morning, and I'm I'm on the set during the commercial break, right before my segment, and they flash to the the cover of the book. Uh, on the big screen in Times Square. And I thought, oh my God, what would Max say about that? And because he, you know, he took the photo on the cover of the book. That's a self-portrait that he took for a photography class at RIT. And, and the assignment was to uh, take a self-portrait uh, for your a, a book of your photography. And this was going to be the author photo on the book flap. And Max so hated having his picture taken that that's the picture he submitted, a one of him from the back. Uh, but uh, I looked at that photo in, in Times Square and I think he would have been mortified at the attention and secretly a little pleased. You know, I, I do have a, a feeling of accomplishment that now that classroom assignment has been officially completed. He is a published photographer and... Uh, uh, probably beyond anybody else in that class. Uh, yeah, it could be. That's a great point. And, uh, it, it's, uh, it, and it's, it is a beautiful photo. Um, I, finally, I, I mean, the, the book is in, in many respects, a, a, a celebration of, of Max, um, um, how do you and, and your family can continue to celebrate him today? I, I, are there big ways? I suspect there are, there are lots of small ways. Yes. Um, when uh, I think, uh, and, and you're seeing a uh, photo of a bench that's on the uh, lake shore at Lake Ontario, where he died, that we had placed in a uh, county park. Uh, a lot of it is with humor. If uh, Max was, uh, if, if he told a joke, sometimes it would be so dry that you'd have to stop and think about it for a minute. And then you would start to laugh and, and, and explain it. And he would thunder, don't explain the joke. You know, <laughs> so if something happens now that makes us laugh and somebody doesn't really get it, you know, we all will chime in, don't explain the joke. Uh, uh, it's, you know, anytime, uh, we, uh, sugared cereals are big, you know, Max was a big believer in sugared cereals and, and, uh, he, he pretty much ate things that were brown, you know, meat, uh, and, uh, and cereal and pretzels. Uh, he was a big carb guy. So that invariably comes up, uh, when those things come up as well. So we, we have our moments, we have our ways with him to keep him around. And you've established a couple of scholarships in his name? Yes, uh, at, at his high school, at the high school our kids went to in Fairfield, Connecticut. And uh, one is for kids who, uh, well, they're all for kids who went to our elementary school. And there's uh, one scholarship uh, two, well, let, let's see, there's two scholarships for uh, merit, two scholarships for kids in need. And uh, all of them uh, are 
we're, we're trolling around for uh, kids that were roughly where he was on the academic spectrum. You know, we're not looking for the, the 4.0s. We're looking for the uh, – Max was a good student, but not a great student. But, you know, and kids who need help. And it's just a way to – another way to perpetuate his memory. Well, Ivan, I, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I, I wish we had more time. We're hitting the, the end of the hour here. I, I, I will close with, with this. I mean, you've, you've done a lifetime of good work. Um, I, um, I, I should have probably put a disclaimer up at the beginning of this that I was not going to be uh, impartial in this. Uh, <laughs> You, you, you've done a lifetime of good work, but you saved your best for Max. Uh, well, thank you. Um, his book, again, is I Keep Trying to Catch His Eye, a memoir of loss, grief, and love. And as always, we, we encourage you to buy it at your local independent bookstore or on bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores across the country. Here, here. I, thank you again, and thank all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Steve. I really enjoyed it, and I uh, appreciate everybody being out there. <laughs>